Hello everyone, this is Krista Soria. Today I wanted to talk a little bit more about some basic steps in developing a quantitative study. We're going to, over the next couple of presentations, talk about each of these big concepts. So first, let's talk about developing a topic idea. So as you're thinking about your research study, and this is, um, I should say, appropriate not only for students who are interested in quantitative research, but these steps are also really helpful for those of you who are interested in qualitative research. It's important to think about topics that are most interesting or engaging to you, whether or not there's folks who might be experts on the subject matter who can serve on your dissertation. If your topics have any applicability or relevance to your journey, profession, or future goals. So um, if you're interested in studying a topic, let's say, um, related to students' use of financial aid, maybe that's because you're interested in a career in financial aid in the future. So thinking about um, what's next for you, what your next steps are, and whether or not your dissertation topic uh, can have relevance to help you get to that next step, I think is also really important. Your values and your paradigms, I think, is really interesting to think about. So um, do you have a strong advocacy lens or social justice lens that might shape um, the scope and the frame of your study? Perhaps you have a really pragmatic lens and you'd like to uh, do something, um, research something that actually has um, some relevance and applicability to other populations, like a program that could be implemented in other places. Um, but your values and paradigms, I think, are really interesting at this stage to also include. Um, it's important to think about some of your goals with your research, whether that might be to improve life with yourself or for, for yourself. So that could be um, by gaining insights and knowledge into a new topic um, that you'll use um, in your workplace or that you'll use to get a promotion or to, to move forward with your career in some capacity. Um, it can be helpful to think about whether or not you can research something that can improve life for others. So the implications of your research, can they be used in other programs or activities to improve life for students or to make life better for faculty? Um, whether you're interested in publishing the results in academia, publications and presentations are very much our academic currency. So are these topics that you're interested in things that you can present at a conference, whether that's a subject matter conference or just a generic general research conference, um, whether you can use the results, as I've mentioned, over and over for promotion or for career advancement, um, you know, those even to solidify your job, right, to sort of you know, validate your position that you're already in. Um, how can you use those results? And then also, um, most importantly, I would say, um, how can you, um, you know, develop a goal to graduate in a really timely fashion? As we always say, a good dissertation is a done dissertation. And so, as you're thinking about goals with your research, you might have a really large overarching research agenda a big goal, right? Like, uh, how can we improve the undergraduate experience for students of color? That's awesome. But let's just take a little piece of that, right? So what are some institutional factors that can support students of color's sense of belonging on campus? It's just a piece of that overarching question. And so as you think about developing your research goals, you know, you might have something like big and broad in mind, but just take a little bit of that uh, for, for your dissertation. And you can continue with your research agenda, of course, after you graduate. Um, but for now, we're just gonna take one little aspect of that um, to get you to the finish line. As you're thinking about engaging topics, think about whether or not your particular topic can sustain your energy and interest for a significant period of time. I wrote my dissertation on uh, students from different social class backgrounds and really looking at the influence of social class on students' involvement on campus. And so I had to write a lot about social class and I had to write about low income students and about working class students. And after I finished my dissertation, I was able to turn that into a manuscript. Um, and I, you know, so I published that into a kind of a smaller book. And uh, I had to keep going, right? And that took a lot of hours, took a lot of time um, outside of work to make that happen. And at that point, I'd already published uh, maybe 10 papers on um, working class students. And I had this manuscript and I had my dissertation and I sort of felt burned out. I was just kind of done with talking about social class because I had sort of built a name for myself when, when talking about working class students and then social class, I kept getting invitations to write chapters for books um, and 
I found it harder and harder to maintain the energy and the motivation that was necessary. Um, so, you know, you may not go that far with your dissertation topic, but regardless, you're going to be working on your dissertation for about a year. And so it needs to be something that's actually interesting and engaging to you. Is your research question rich and robust? Um, is it easily answered or difficult to answer? So ideally you'd want a research question that's a little bit difficult to answer because you're going to be writing pages and pages and pages um, related to your research question um, or, or questions. Um, and if your question is too simple, uh, it's not an interesting dissertation, it's not a robust dissertation, it may not even qualify as a dissertation. So a question like, what is the graduation rate of students of color at St. Cloud State University? Um, that's not really a dissertation question because that question can easily be answered if you go to the office, I'm guessing the, the Office of Institutional Research. Um, somebody has that answer already for you and so it's not really worth investigating or interesting. It's definitely not worth 100 pages in a dissertation. Um, but what factors can be leveraged to support students of color's retention and graduation at St. Cloud State? Now that's robust, that's interesting, um, and it's not easily answered, right? So that's, that's more along the lines of a great dissertation question. Uh, I think sometimes it's helpful to sort of be on the cutting edge or to think about topics that are interesting, trendy, or maybe novel. Um, so in higher education, we are talking a lot lately about mental health. We're talking a lot about campus climate. We're talking a lot about thinking about like growth mindset and grit and resiliency. Uh, and these are topics of conversation that are coming up quite a bit. And so I think it's interesting to sort of be one of those researchers who's on the cutting edge of things to say, yeah, like we've got something that's just new enough and just interesting enough that the results of your paper are going to be um, really interesting to your readers. Uh, it might be helpful to have a personal connection to your topic. Um, sometimes this is good and bad. So I just advised a student in a different university. She is a, a black woman who is um, a minister, like the uh, director of campus ministries at uh, a regional what, uh, a university in the region. And uh, for her topic, she wants to interview other black women who are directors of campus ministries at other universities. And, uh, and it's, it's so, it hits so close to home. It's essentially going to be a dissertation about herself, right, in some ways. Um, there's ways that people can engage in that type of research, right? I mean, of course, you know, I don't want to invalidate anybody's experiences, but I think it's important to say, can you look at this topic objectively? Um, so I was interested in studying social class and the experiences of first gen students and working class students because I am a first generation student and I was a working class student very much and still have a big working class identity. And so consequently, what I was reading was very validating and interesting and important. But as a researcher, we all have the responsibility to be objective, and we all have a responsibility to let the data speak for itself, as opposed to imposing our bias on the data. And so this woman that I was consulting on her dissertation said, I wanna know what makes these women tough and resourceful and what gives them a sense of resiliency and grit. And I thought, well, first, as a researcher, you don't know yet that those women that you're gonna interview have those qualities. You might have those qualities, but you're, and then you're assuming that other people like you have those qualities, but they may not. And so it's really important quantitatively or qualitatively to sort of bracket your experiences. It's helpful to write dissertations. It can be very engaging to write about things that connect to your personal experiences. But at the end of the day, you still need to be objective and you need to bracket and set aside your experiences and let the data emerge and tell the story that is naturally there, not the story that is your story, right? And so that can be really challenging. So um, in, by personal connection, it doesn't even have to be identity-based. It could be, um, for instance, if you work as um, a director of a nursing program or faculty member of a nursing program, you may want to study nursing students. Um, and again, that's, that's really great. There's a great connection. There's a lot of relevance. You know, going back to the previous slide, there's a lot of great things about that topic. It'll help your it might help your practice, it might help your students, it might be a contribution to the field, you could present the research at a nursing conference, that's all awesome. Um, 
but you have to remain objective and you have to let the data just tell the story without imposing your bias on it. So a note of caution there about having that personal connection. It's great, but it can also be very challenging to set aside your bias, your perspectives, your beliefs, your objectives, your agenda. Um, it can be, it can be hard to set that aside and then, um, and approach it objectively. So, uh, but it's necessary. Uh, it, it might be uh, challenging to locate subject matter experts. Your advisor may not have knowledge about your topic or your advisor may have knowledge. Um, so it's helpful to maybe ask your advisor or choose an advisor who is the right fit for you. Um, it's also important to think about constructing a committee of individuals who know a little bit about your topic and can address at least your methodology or can discuss um, you know, some of the implications of your work. Uh, it might also be helpful to think about consulting with experts in your profession, even your classmates um, or among some of your mentors as well to get those experts involved in the process. And then it might be helpful to also consider whether you know some of the paradigmatic scholars and you may not personally know them and you may not be able to get them to actually be in your committee, but can you identify them? Do you know who are the leading experts in your field? Um, there's a number of folks who, and I, you know, for some reason I've been in a lot of dissertations, <laughs> uh, not necessarily at St. Cloud State, but other places where um, the students are writing a lot about professional development in um, K through 12 schools. And uh, the number one person is Linda Darling Hammond. And I know that now because um, she's the most paradigmatic. She's like the scholar who cited the most when it comes to discussing uh, professional development opportunities for teachers. Um, so, you know, you need to be able to, who at this point, figure out who the experts are in your field. If you're discussing students' retention, it's going to be Tinto and a few others. Um, if you're discussing students' involvement, it's Aston. Um, these are just folks who in higher education are so well known that they must be cited at this point. If you're thinking about selecting a topic for professional development, it's helpful to think about whether or not the results will contribute to your field, um, if they're going to lead to improvements in your area, and along those lines, it's helpful to think about who your primary audience is as you're writing about the significance of your topic. And again, this is relevant for qualitative or quantitative. Um, thinking about your primary audience, who's going to benefit from the most, uh, the most from your research, and then what are they going to be able to do with it? How will they lead positive social change in a particular area. It might also be helpful to think about whether or not the results might make you well known in the field. So can you discuss your results in other professional settings like conferences or even in future job interviews? Uh, you know, what might make your results um, sort of stand apart as you're thinking about your own professional development? And then, of course, will your research get you to the next level, however you're defining that. So that might be, um, I, you know, I am a little bit worried about job security, and I just want to sort of be able to say I have my ED, therefore I'm, you know, qualified to be a dean of a, a program or something like that. Um, but either, you know, either, whether you want to stay at your present level or move on to the next level, how will your research get you there? Um, however you're defining your next steps for yourself. As you think about your values and paradigms, uh, it can be useful to go back to Creswell and Creswell. They have uh, four general paradigms uh, that influence how people undertake their research. As I already gave you examples for advocacy or pragmatic, but there's also a post-positivistic, and that's more of an empirical, data-driven, research-oriented framework or constructivist, which is working with others to incite positive social change. So along those lines, you might be interested in something like action research, where you develop research questions and answer them along with community partners. It's also helpful, I think, to think about your personal values. So, um, you know, I personally have a strong value in supporting um, the students who are the first in their families to go to college because I believe that higher education can help with uh, social uplift and um, the advancement of, of low income folks into middle and upper classes. And that's a lens that I used as I was writing my dissertation because I wanted to write about some of the inequities and in folks from uh, in social classes, essentially. Um, I write a lot about how higher education is very middle class and upper class in terms of its orientation, and it thus makes folks from low income backgrounds feel like they don't belong in the field of higher education. So I write a lot about that, um, and that influenced my, my dissertation topic. 
Um, your graduation, your goal for graduation should be paramount, but I also recommend that you think about uh, the goals as falling under the very well-known SMART goals. So specific, measurable, um, attainable, I think it's attainable, oh, um, uh, realistic, and then time-oriented. Um, I forget the A, that might be wrong. <laughs> um, but either way, um, you know, bigger, broader goals. How do we improve life for students of color on campus? That's awesome. But for your dissertation, you need to take a specific piece of that, something that's very measurable. Um, you need to have a project that you can actually finish um, in two semesters or whatever, and something that's realistic, um, which might mean interviewing 10 students as opposed to surveying 20,000 students, right? So have those SMART goals in mind as you're continuing along. As I mentioned before too, a goal could be to improve life for yourself. Um, and uh, it, as I mentioned, beware of bias, um, but I think it's also important to think beyond anecdotes and to actually get data and substantiate your claims. This is especially important for when it comes to writing a problem statement. So problem statements are not just your pet peeves or your personal experiences, um, but actually something that has real data behind it. Um, and so if, if you are frustrated that, uh, and this was a student's, not for a dissertation, but a research project once in one of my classes. She wrote about how frustrated she was that the parking meters were on 30 minute increments, although classes were like an hour and 15 minutes. And so she felt like she was paying for time in the parking lot because they were at half an hour, you know, she paid for an hour and a half or two hours at a time. She was paying for time that she wasn't. She was really mad about that. And I thought, like, that is not a problem. <laughs> that is not a real world problem that, you know, that given the amount of time that you might take to walk from class back to your parking spot, a half an hour is probably pretty reasonable. Either way, it just wasn't, it didn't rise to the level of being problematic. I also had a student, um, and this happened just this past summer, again, a different campus, but she um, was really upset with the way the Department of Education in Minnesota defined success in the K through 12 schools, because she worked for an online school, and the majority of their students did not graduate in a timely fashion, if they graduated at all. And uh, so she thought that her school was unfairly being penalized because of it. And that was kind of the problem. And so her question was, um, is the Minnesota Department of Education's um, definition of success accurate? And I was like, that's not a research problem. <laughs> like you're coming in saying it's not accurate. It doesn't reflect my students. But you know, through her research, it's, it's not really a research question. It's just an opinion. Um, and it can't really, you can't gather data related to that opinion. So that was really problematic. And that's an example of, you know, certainly that was her idea to improve life, not only for herself, but her students and her school um, by redefining success at the state of Minnesota. But that's not a research project. That's more of a policy agenda. So she was biased. She had a lot of anecdotal information. Um, you know, she was looking at her own school. She didn't look at whether or not um, the problem was the same problem for, you know, maybe a hundred schools in Minnesota, right? So she could gather data on like, you know what, this definition of success does not reflect reality. She didn't have any of those data. She was just mad from her own school's perspective. So, you know, yes, sometimes your, your research can improve life for yourself, but you know, your audience can't be yourself, right? Um, you, you can't enter into research being too biased and too sort of advocacy oriented to make some social change when you might not accomplish that with a dissertation. And it's not often the goal of a dissertation. And you have to think beyond anecdotes, beyond your own personal perspectives and experiences. You have to get bigger data to prove that, yes, this is a big enough problem to, um, to warrant this research. And then again, um, improving life for others. And most of this will come into play when you're writing about the significance of your work and then the recommendations that meet the needs of your audiences. As I mentioned before, some of your goals could include presentations at conferences, um, and it can be helpful to, as you're thinking ahead, 
you know, earn some lines on your CV or get some deadlines going that can help you with that. Um, I often write my papers um, best when I submit them to, a, like I submit a, a, an abstract to a conference and they say, great, your papers due October 22nd. And it's like, awesome, I have a deadline, I have an obligation to meet. And such a deadline can also help you with writing your dissertation as well. Um, so you could submit a piece of it to a conference and you have to know for yourself, oh, I have to get my methods done because I need it for that conference deadline. Um, so publications can be really helpful as well. Um, try to collaborate as much as you can. Really think about breaking your dissertation down into two to three separate publications and think about levels of, of journals. So you could submit one of those papers from your dissertation to the highest possible, most prestigious journal. And if you get rejected, you can take that feedback and move down a level and then move down a level and so on. So that can be really useful. Um, so uh, one of the things I'd like to do to initiate our class time together is to sort of practice. I'd like you to think about your primary research interests, the topics that are most interesting to you, your values and your paradigms, what, what makes your topic maybe engaging or interesting, and then your goals. And I'd like you to um, think about this, even if your project is qualitative, um, you know, or quantitative, but even if your project is qualitative, I'd like you to think through these steps, because I really would like you to begin to think about your dissertation. Um, even though this is a quantitative class and you've got more classes to go, I'd like you to start thinking about these things as they relate to your dissertation. So please address these questions, uh, you know, a sentence or two each. You do not have to go into significant length. Um, it's just a discussion board post, so we're looking for, you know, like a paragraph, maybe two paragraphs. Um, if you write, you know, pages and pages, you're going to lose your reader, right? So, um, so just a couple of notes and topics and thoughts, thinking through your primary research interests, what topics are most interesting to you, uh, values and paradigms, whether what makes your topic sort of, you know, edgy or, or new or novel or interesting. Um, and then uh, your goals. So if you could please um, respond to these questions in our first discussion board, that would be wonderful. Thanks so much.